Welcome to DLN Extend. We choose topics covered by the Destination Linux Network that we think need further discussion and extend the conversation here. These shows include Destination Linux, Ask Noah, Linux for Everyone, This Week in Linux, DOS Geek, Tux Digital, and Zebedee Boss Gaming. I'm Eric. And I'm Nate, a Linux, fitness, and vintage tech enthusiast with an almost unhealthy obsession with the OpenSUSE project. So, Nate, what have you been up to this week? Well, beyond the work and family things that keep getting in the way of my Linuxing, I've been uh, working on setting up a RAID 10 array. I don't know if that's the right term for it uh, in my workstation. Originally, I wanted it to be the, the only drive, like the only set of drives, so six drives for a, a RAID 10 array. And I couldn't actually have it boot because the BIOS or whatever couldn't recognize a Linux RAID as a boot device. So I set up another device to bootstrap off of that and really actually ended up messing a lot of things. I had to boot into MX Linux and use Gparted to kind of rebaseline things. So when you say a Linux ar- array, you, you mean like an LVM array? Well, I mean like a RAID array, like a, a it's a six disk RAID 10 setup. I was just curious because I know you have the, the disks themselves, but you are creating the array. How is it that you're doing that? Is that with LVM or with something else? Well, actually, there's a tool inside Yast when you set it up that you can actually select drives you want to be part of an array. So you, under RAID, you select the eligible drives, and then you select the RAID uh, level that you want. So I'm doing RAID 10. And then that shows up basically as a drive that you can partition. So I put one giant partition on there with a ButterFS root partition, and then that would have home and everything else. But because it's a software RAID, the motherboard, the BIOS, whatever, the boot system, cannot recognize that array, that clump of disks, as a bootable device. So I threw in a, a drive number 7 to be a boot drive. And I moved some things around like where, what spot slots they were. So SDA the first drive to be recognized would be the boot device. And I successfully installed everything, but then I got to the grub rescue point and that's where I'm at right now. So until I figure that part out, I've already talked to some some other much smarter than me people out there and there is a solution. It's just not evident to me at this point. And you believe that the cause is that it's the array itself and not it, it's not the file system or anything like that. It's It's just your system's not recognizing the array as a device properly. And it was the array itself, did it contain the boot partition or did did you have a separate disk? That's what you're saying disk seven is for now. Yeah. Yeah. Disk seven or or now actually disk one uh, dev slash SDA has a boot sector. And then I I made a swap, you know, just because I have 80 80 gigabytes of storage to use on it. So may as well use part of it for a swap, right? I don't know why I just did. Because why not? And then I left it unpartitioned. So then I had that as the BIOS boot, mounted to slash boot and then swap and then the main array as you know the root partition with everything with all the sub volumes and everything else okay well so then the the saga continues then it does well it's a learning process yes was designed for people who know what they're doing and and the reality is there's a lot of things i don't know what i'm doing so you know it's good times it's uh, opportunity to learn well, let's just call this some end user testing. I believe that if you find anything to be uh, lacking in Yast, that you will likely be logging things and giving feedback. Is that correct? At this point, I have some bug reports I am going to file because there is one small little issue with the system recognizing what the BIOS boot. And then I'm also going to improve the wiki on how to actually do this because most of the wiki is around using hardware RAID, not software RAID. From the DLN Discourse Forum, the most viewed topic was the DLN Gaming Night from Saturday, November 9th. I saw you on the mumble, but I didn't see you playing anything. Did you uh, have any fun doing the golf with friends? Were you not one of the friends they golfed with? I was not. I did not uh, partake in the games. I did help moderate a little bit on Mumble. Unfortunately, both Zeb and I had a bit of a conflict because I tend to do the Biddle shows. That weekend happened to be the second Saturday of the month, and that is when there's both the Europe edition and the normal Biddle. So I was on both of those and wasn't able to participate as much as I would have normally. So maybe next time there won't be a conflict like that. But uh, that golf with friends definitely looks like a good time. It was it was very silly. I, I had both Ryan's feed and Michael's feed up simultaneously so that I could sort of watch it from different perspectives. And the physics of that game, I question slightly. <laughs> I'm not, not sure I completely think it's accurate, but it, it is fun. That's for sure. 
the physics did seem a little bit exaggerated for sure. I installed every game that I didn't have that they played, but I never actually had the time to jump on. And I was also participating in Biddle as well. So There was a good turnout on Mumble itself and lots of folks joined in. We had a good crowd and people that had started earlier in the stream. So Jason and Zeb actually stuck it out much longer than we thought they would. I would say that it was definitely successful and they'll be looking forward to the next one. I'm hoping that when they do another one, they play the same games, or at least some of the same games, because now I have some familiarity with them, and I can actually jump in, hopefully, next time. I do think they're going to change some things. Maybe they'll add a few in, change a few around, but probably the ones that are the most popular, or let's say maybe the most accessible, because I know Zeb has some issues with first-person shooters, and and not just him. There's a lot of people that actually do with that whole field of view thing with those and just the fast motion. He was able to stick it out longer than he thought he would, but uh, it's nice that they have a mix of games that appeal to different people. So you can go in and do CSGO, or you can play golf with friends. They're trying to appeal to everybody, and everybody should have an opportunity opportunity to jump in and play and um, everyone is welcome to do that. The next one will be announced as soon as they plan it and hope to see you there. On the last Destination Linux, although many topics were covered, one that I was really interested in was the PinePhone pre-order launch. It's seemingly way ahead of schedule. And I'm pretty excited. I'm, I'm not going to be on this first batch, I don't think. I'm not, I'm not prepared to take on that project. But this is interesting because I didn't think we we're going to see another up the Pine phone until like Q1, Q2 of next year. And the way Pine has been talking about the process, being very fastidious about the process and making sure everything is right and that they can support this. Now, I'm not really excited about phones. I don't really care. Uh, phones are just a tool, just a wrench. I'm not one that chases after the new hardware. But this excites me more than any phone that I've seen because it's going to be a Linux phone, a real Linux phone that's mostly open. So I'm truly looking forward to this. I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm not going to be in the Braveheart group. It has nothing to do with my lack of confidence that it's not a good device. I really do believe them when they say that they've worked out them. Now, they claim all of the major showstopper type of hardware and software issues. There may be still some rough edges, and I think they're pretty forthcoming with that. A lot of it's going to come down to the software itself and the uh, distributions that are going to support this. I agree. This seems sooner than what we were all thinking about. I mean, Lucas was on Destination Linux a few weeks back, and from what I took away from that, they were planning to focus on the Pine Book and then do something with Pine Phone. So it is interesting to see them try to fit this in before the Chinese New Year, perhaps just not want to let too much of a lull there. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still 100% excited about this. I agree. I don't need another phone, but just the idea. I mean, I'm almost thinking of this device as a tiny Linux computer that happens to do some phone things. And if it's good enough that I could use it as a phone, fantastic. I will. But I won't even care if I just get to use it as almost like a test device to just be able to access the UB ports and Plasma Touch and other projects that are out there so that I can use them and even give feedback and hopefully improve them and just see as as they evolve with devices like the Pine Phone being available. I really see it going somewhere, not expecting it to be perfect to start or even in the short term, but having enough momentum and enough interest that we do see a workable Linux-based phone within a fairly short amount of time. What excites me about the hardware specifications, it's not the processor, it's not the screen, it's the headphone jack. They're keeping the headphone jack on there. I'm like, thank you. It's not really practical to constantly use Bluetooth. It's just not. On my phone today, I plug in some headphones put the phone in my back pocket, and I can walk around with my phone basically all day and not have to worry about charging my headphones. So I'm really excited about having a phone that still has a headphone jack in it. It's just one less thing to have to worry about keeping charged. And for me, it's about choice. You know, the, the headphone jack allows me to use any kind of headphones I want, and actually not just headphones. I can use that as a way to interface with other devices, use different kind of patch cables. It's the audio interface to the device. And if Bluetooth is all you have, it's, it's just limiting to me, especially from a headphone standpoint. I know people like, what are they, AirPods or whatever those Apple devices are. Yeah, something like that. And there are others, I know, but they tend to be expensive. They're all battery powered, obviously, and they are also of pretty varying quality. And if you forget to charge them, then you don't have headphones. And I know people say, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I don't listen to them that long, but I'm, I'm in the same camp as you. I can just pull out headphones 
plug them in and there is no worry about, oh, geez, did I remember to charge these or anything like that. It's just, it's what makes sense. And I understand that manufacturers are trying to find ways to make phones smaller and fit more components and maybe more battery. And there's all sorts of reasons why I can't argue against it making sense to not have it. But there is one compelling argument. I listen to a lot of audio on my phone and I prefer to listen to that audio on wired headphones. This week on Ask Noah, the braver of the hosts on this show, (laughs) join Noah for a discussion about Microsoft and the changes that they've made to their software and how that's impacting the enterprise and and the workplace. So Nate, you went on with Noah and had a a fantastic discussion. How did that come about and uh, and how did that go? I wouldn't say the braver of the two of us. I would say probably the the least smart of the two of us, you know, the one that, that didn't know any better, if anything. I had a good time. I enjoyed talking with Noah. I know he has some slightly different views than I do on some things. And and I've kind of softened on Microsoft in the last, I'd say probably about a year or so, seeing some of the changes that have happened in my workplace where Linux is starting to proliferate. Now with VS Code on Linux and PowerShell and some other whiz-bang tools, now you see these Linux workstations kind of cropping in alongside these Microsoft workstations, or I should say Windows workstations. We just had a great discussion. I, I really enjoyed it. From what he said, it was it was eye opening for him as well because he doesn't hear these things. I think that the future's bright. This is the the best time in Linux that I've ever had. It's interesting to say that Microsoft is making that possible. Something I never ever 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 thought I would ever see or say. And here we are in 2019. I've got a repository from Microsoft on my system, and that wasn't anywhere in my roadmap for sure. VS Code has been a complete success for Microsoft. Your explanation of how across different operating systems and having different team members and just the idea that you can all be using the same tool and that that tool works exactly the same on all those systems and is completely capable of editing whatever language you're using. It's certainly not a full-blown IDE like Visual Studio, but it is the tool that so many different people are using for so many different languages. The way that you were able to articulate that to him and his response, I thought was great because Noah's such a measured, level-headed person when it comes to just being pragmatic about, here's a problem that needs a solution. And I think like we talked about in our proprietary software, software discussion last week, whatever the right tool for the job is, if there is an open source option, then hopefully that fits the need. And if you can use it, great. But if you can't, then knowing that there are other options out there, and and to be fair, VS Code is open source, but does have some telemetry in it. And I know some people maybe don't like that. VS Codium is out there, which is a, a build of VS Code without the telemetry. So functions exactly the same way. I'm not trying to convince anyone of the virtue And I don't think you were either. I think what was valuable about the conversation was that you gave a very specific use case of how your company is able to use that software to great effect and has helped you solve some problems that you didn't have a better solution for. So I think that's great. And and just his appreciation of you giving him that kind of feedback and then him being able to learn from that. So I thought the exchange itself was great. Definitely worth listening to if folks haven't checked that out. This week on Linux for Everyone, there was an AMA with Jason. And if you don't know what AMA is, because I had to look it up because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not hip on my acronyms, it's Ask Me Anything. So I think that's a Reddit term. I don't know. Anyway, the whole thing was very interesting. And you know, I like to find out about people. I'm, I'm very interested in people. And the part that really stuck out to me the most was the very last question. I don't exactly remember the wording of the question, but ultimately it was finding your purpose and living life to its fullest at whatever age you are, in this case, Jason being age 44. And this actually really gave me pause to think. I'm very rapidly approaching the the big 4-0. And I feel like, you know, in the last couple of years and uh, meeting you, Eric and, and Rocco and all the Destination Linux crew, I feel like there's kind of been like a, a renaissance or a new life that's kind of happened to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm at middle age now or somewhere nearby, I guess. In some ways, this has been like the most fun and happiest time of my life, you know, getting to know all these fellow nerds with the, with the interest that I've been carrying around almost solo for the last 39 years. <laughs> it's it's just been really fun. And it's all around Linux and, and open source and 
people of similar ideals about, you know, software freedom. And so I, that really kind of struck me and underscored, you know, maybe some of those other ventures of mine, those other, and let's, let's just call them failures. You know, they didn't work out, but maybe it's good they didn't work out. Maybe had I had they worked out, I wouldn't be talking to you here now, Eric, and I wouldn't be having the fun I'm having, and I wouldn't be interacting with literally some of the most brilliant minds I've ever met, you know, around the world. I totally agree, and I can really latch onto that and say, you know, this purpose that's in my life now, this excitement, and living life to its fullest, and that can be a lot of gray areas there, but living life to its fullest potential of purpose is kind of what I feel like I'm moving into now, and, and that's largely thanks to you, actually and many others. That's really what I took out of it. And I, I really enjoyed it. It was a great talk and really encouraged me. And if you need some encouragement, that's a, that's a really good episode to listen to. And to echo your sentiments on the community side of things, I also was a solo user of Linux for a very long time. And not just Linux. I've talked about this before. The idea of having any type of community around technology outside of people that you worked with who made a living off technology, where you're not necessarily doing it as a social enterprise, but because it's something you do for a living. And having the outlet to talk to other people about things that you are passionate about, not just because you earn a living from them, but because you are interested in them. And having spent so many years not having that kind of an outlet and sounding board, yes, the, the friendships, it's not just geeking out on technology. It's making connections with other people. And it is about enriching your life because I had now have friends and people I talk to literally all around the world. And it's mind blowing to me that something like Linux and the community that surrounds it gives me the opportunity to engage with so many different people from so many different walks of life. And age is not even a factor there because some of them are young and some of them are much older than me. And I'm 44 as well, which is, I guess, just a funny coincidence. The same sentiment that you give about meeting me and others and being able to have these discussions, I love talking to people like this. But I also have never had the opportunity to talk to people about things that I am truly passionate about. I was hesitant for a very long time to engage with the community, and I can tell you that it has been nothing but positive since I've done that. So if you're wondering if you should jump in and any of the ways to, to get in touch, you know, I'm obviously going to say Destination Linux Network is a great place to start, but there are other communities out there as well, other outlets, local meetup groups. That's something I actually haven't done yet, Nate. Is that something you've done where you've gone to like a lug or a, a meetup or something in person? I'm, I want to do it. I just haven't had the opportunity yet. The last meetup I've ever done was in the 90s with an Amiga group. And that was, you know, pre-Linux, obviously. But I've, I've often thought about and toyed around the idea of having some sort of a go to the public library, you know, bring some computers there, lay them out just for people to play with, you know, bang around on it. And then maybe every week do like a different distribution, you know, so I'll cycle between both of them, you know, Leap and Tumbleweed. Um, I'm kidding. There's, there's others. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, but I'd like to have something like that locally. I mean, I do have a one local Linux user that I, I, I talk to frequently, but you know, it'd be nice to have a few others or introduce a few other people to it. I, I think it'd be fun. You know, right now I got my online lug and it'd be nice to have maybe a local lug too. On This Week in Linux, Michael covered a few topics that we wanted to jump into. The first one was OpenSUSE voting on the name change. There was definitely some speculation on whether or not this was something that was going to pass and whether they'd move away from that name. They have voted to not change the name. So, Nate, what's your take on that? I'm kind of glad. I know there's some people they wanted a name change, and, and, I, and they even kicked around some names I thought were less than stellar. Like, I realize that the, the arguments are open SUSE. Nobody knows how to pronounce it correctly. They say SUSE or SUSE or SUSE. And frankly, I don't care. I, it's like, to me, it's, a, it's, it's as bad as Ubuntu or Ubuntu or Ubuntu or whatever. I like these, the, the corporate association. And there's there's a uh, an advantage there as far as like the leap to SLE or SUSE Linux Enterprise. They're binary, basically identical. So if, let's say, you were con a consultant or you did IT management and you got somebody started on open SUSE leap and it was time to move them to like a more of a service contract to have SUSE corporate backing or whatever without doing any reinstallation or anything of that nature you literally just point the repositories to SLE and you're done and there's no reinstallation or anything of that nature it's all done so uh the the vote came in there was uh 42 in favor of changing the name 255 not in favor 
and the total number of voters is 491. I, and I was one of those votes and I did vote no. So that means that 51.9% of the voting members actually voted. Now, there was some discussion in the mailing list that there should have been a abstain from voting option. I didn't really understand why. I, I probably should have read more into that because if you don't vote, that's abstaining from voting, I guess, or they wanted to vote, but abstain. I don't know. Uh, regardless, there was there was a little bit of, of uh, irritation in the uh, between some people. There was some heat in the conversation. Hopefully, it'll die down. It'll just kind of keep moving on to doing what the Open Susa community does and keeps building the projects that they work on. So, yeah, I'm glad. I'm just glad it's done. I think the last thing they would have wanted was for this to be disruptive or to, I guess, cause any problems rather than just giving folks a chance to voice their opinion. And so I'm glad the vote happened and I'm glad it's done. And it seems like there's tremendous support to keep the name, obviously. And um, so there you go. Decision made. It was mentioned, though, that if it's a close vote, that's more problematic than if it's a greater difference between the yes and the no, because then the decision is more clear. So it was a very conclusive vote. So it's going to stay open, Sousa, for the time being. The other thing that Michael discussed was Linus Torvalds claiming to not be a programmer anymore, which I have a sneaking suspicion that's going to be hard for him to act and not poke in there every now and then. I think the gist is that it's more important for him to be the maintainer, to be the one who is overseeing the commits and things like that. And so rather than him spending as much time programming, just taking that that role, maybe by him just making this claim it gives him that ability to sort of step back and say, I, I'm not going to be the one that's doing all of those things. I also thought this was very interesting that he made the statement. I mean, he did start the Linux kernel. He did start Git, and they've both turned into rather huge projects. He also made the claim that he sometimes feels like he has imposter syndrome, which says to me he's obviously a humble guy, actually, if, if that's really truly how he feels. And that's a good kind of leader you should have overseeing the project. Maybe he has some rough edges around him. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Everybody has their thing. Ultimately, he, you know, him, he's still reviewing code and you know, I think he's integrating into it. So it's not like he's not programming. I think he's probably just being more of a, he's more like the professor at the front of the class reviewing your work now. And I think that's a good role for him because hopefully that means that he's taking some of that time and mentoring other people to carry on the torch I mean, I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon, but you're right. I hadn't considered that, that the idea of that it's probably a good time for him to start looking at, you know, how does this live on without my continuous direct involvement? I have this thought every now and then, Nick, you mentioned two projects, you know, the, the Linux kernel itself and then Git. In terms of transformational technology, I have to wonder, being someone who's responsible for those things, how you do come to terms with that. Because, I mean, you mentioned imposter syndrome, and I think everybody has that. And, it, and it's healthy, I, th I think, to have that because it, it does keep you grounded and honest and not letting yourself think that your opinion is the absolute best opinion. But the idea that something I created would have that sort of impact on the world and the idea that modern communication infrastructure exists on Linux and, and it goes well beyond that, but just the idea that you know, it is a foregone conclusion that, you know, things run on Linux, right? This whole Linux is everywhere and, oh, you know, nobody knows what Linux is. They don't have to. It, it, it is everywhere. It does everything uh, in terms of those, those use cases. So you have to wonder what type of impact that would have on you and how you could stay grounded. It'll be interesting to see how history looks back at this time of computer science and so forth. Now, every generation has had leaders and pioneers, and Linus is a pioneer in the open source world, uh, more so than probably than many. At least he, he started the ball rolling on something pretty huge. Just, it'll be interesting looking back on this you know, 30 years from now. Das Geek had a video this week on getting the most out of your Pinebook Pro. He put together some nice tips and tricks. That's on his website. You can go to dasgeekcommunity.com and you can look at his notes that he did a brain dump on. So in, in the video, he was going through some of his uh, struggles and, and so forth, but there's a, a lack of ARM software in the standard repos. And he had better success with snaps than he did with Flatpak. And something that we forget to take into consideration on ARM is that it is a different architecture, which means that you don't have 
complete parity with the x86 software that's out there. So he had to make some adjustments to the software choices. He was able to get OpenShot to work on there. He couldn't install VS Code, so he installed Genie. And he's going to have a full review that comes later. But I've actually dealt with this with other ARM-based devices, which is kind of why I'm not like a huge ARM fan. I, I think it's good. It has its place you know, for things like phones and tablets. Although uh, a little laptop like this, I think would be great for just you know distraction-free writing or, or more simple type tasks. But I mean, he was able to run OpenShot and edit video with it. So that means it's not too bad as far as performance goes. He played uh, Super Tux, which, you know, my kids enjoy. So it's kind of funny watching a grown man play it on a, on a YouTube stream. You said you, uh, you've you only done Pi-hole on an ARM-based device. So you've not, have you worked with any other ARM-based devices? I haven't. I've run Raspbian on it and I've played around with the desktop, but I never really took it seriously in, as in trying to use it as a, as a normal system. And I've thought of it in terms of projects. And, and yes, Pi-hole was the, the latest project that I've tried that I've had great success with. Just the idea of using it as a day-to-day -day machine, I hadn't ever really thought about the fact that the repository, the software repository that's going to come with your distribution is going to have a limited set of software because it's going to rely on the software software being released and packaged for ARM-based processors. Now, Ubuntu just recently announced that they want to support the Raspberry Pi 4. And so I think with them coming on board, you've already got Debian support. Ryan mentioned Manjaro and Art and, uh, and their support. So I, I think between that and then the universal package format, Snaps, Alan Pope had mentioned that when they build Snaps, they're building it for all the architectures. So there, I don't think it's going to be as big a problem as maybe I'm imagining it to be, but it's definitely something that I hadn't considered and that Ryan covered as being a potential pitfall for folks trying to use these devices. The idea of the full general purpose desktop, maybe we're not 100% there right now with having all of the software be available. But it sounds like as more people adopt this platform, that the likelihood of software developers and maintainers packaging things for ARM is probably going to be much higher and that over time, you will see native support for more and more software. I have a Pine 64. It's a A64 DB 2G Rev B from 2016. I, I backed the, the project way back when. And I will say that I've been very happy with its performance as far as like very basic desktop usage. I have Ubuntu Mate on there and it runs really great, honestly. just It's just a great little machine. I don't use it very much because I don't have a... It had a need for a little while, but then it was replaced with like a regular proper laptop. And, and so now it's just sitting idle again. But something that I, I think about often is the open build service. They support the ARM architecture. The thing that I'm not really sure on is if it's compiled for ARM Raspberry Pi, not obviously not the image and the, how they you know, it boots and all that, the hardware piece of it, like the, the device drivers, but the software itself. Will ARM software for the Raspberry Pi work on the Pine64? I know the Pine 64 is 64 bit and the Raspberry Pi is, at least Pi 2 was 32 bit, I think. And I could be wrong on that. I know that some of it's 32 bit and I think the Pine 4 is 64 bit, but I, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. I, I'm not really up on my Pies. I'm down on my Pies. We're not up. So the I got the Pine 64 because it was 64 bit and had more power and it could address more memory, I believe, at least at the time. But it would be nice if more projects or more distributions adopted something like the open build service that OpenSUSE has, because that will build for other architectures. And then that would you know help to solve some of those lack of software issues. I need to learn more about the Pine 64. I, I feel like I'm kind of behind on my hardware knowledge with this. I'm pretty excited about the, the Pine book because that, can, that adds more legitimacy to the Pine platform, if I may call it that, with the tablet and the phone and everything else. So if it all has the same code base and they keep the same variety of ARM architecture stays the same, that means we're going to have solutions to that software deficit if there's a larger platform to develop against. That's what I'm looking forward to, is seeing more of these devices and more targets for ARM. So we can, you know, do some more playing. Because I, I like playing with these little single board computers. They are fun. We'd like to continue the discussion with you everywhere that we are, or anywhere, or wherever you would like. Places like Telegram, Discourse, Mumble, or Discord. Visit the DLN website for information on how to connect to the social channels and also the shows and creators at destinationlinux.network. So where can we find more information on you, Eric? I tend to hang out on the DLN Discourse server myself. That's my preferred means of engaging and discussing things. 
You can also find all of my social network profiles and links and all of that if you head to the creators section on destinationlinux.network. How about you, Nate? Well, you can find my information also on the creators section where all my doobly-doos are there. Or you can go to cubiclenate.com and links to my regular written blatherings, my uh, podcast I do on the side, and my uh, YouTube channel is there as well. As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week with another episode of DLN Extend. Until then, have a great week, everyone. Thank you.